We're on panel four now. Uh, can corporations be sued for global warming? Uh, very pleased to introduce this panel and our chair, Cassandra Burke Robertson, the John Deaver Drinko Baker Hostetler Prof Professor of Law and Director of the Center for Professional Ethics here at Case Western Reserve University School of Law. Take it away. And the presentations today have been absolutely fabulous. I really appreciate everybody staying till the late in the day panel on Friday. Um, and as Avi mentioned, we're going to be talking about can corporations be sued over climate change. Um, I'm going to go through and introduce our panelists first, and then they will each speak for about 15 minutes. Um, our first panelist will actually be appearing over Zoom, um, and that is Alan Kanner, who graduated from Harvard Law School and then clerked for the late Judge Robert S. Vance of the U.S. Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, your microphone. It's not working. It is working. Great. Thank you. Um, so, introducing Alan Kanner. Um, he founded the firm of Kanner and Whiteley in 1981 and has since acquired a national reputation in the fields of complex litigation, environmental law, and consumer fraud. Uh, relevant to the topics we'll be talking about today, Allen represented the state of New Jersey in a major natural resource damages case that recently ended in the largest settlement in New Jersey history for natural resource damages. In addition, Ellen has represented the state of Louisiana in the Deepwater Horizon oil spill litigation, which resulted in the largest settlement on record for natural resource damage claims and economic losses, with Louisiana receiving the largest share of about $8 billion, the single largest state NRD recovery. Allen currently represents the state of New Jersey in a number of natural resource damages cases, the state of New Mexico against the United States Air Force, um, the state of Vermont for PFAS contamination generally, and the Conservation Law Foundation in a landmark case against ExxonMobil for climate change effects. He also serves as lead plaintiff's counsel in a national MDL class action against Dollar General for the sale of obsolete motor oils. Um, our second speaker today is Wes Henriksen, who is an associate professor at Barry University School of Law. Professor Henriksen's research centers on legal responses to the intentional dissemination of false and misleading claims by politicians, the media, and corporations. This scholarly focus intersects with numerous doctrinal areas, including the First Amendment, torts, public health, and environmental law. He's the author of two books and multiple articles. Um, then we'll be hearing from Jimmy May, who is the Distinguished Professor of Law and founder of the Global Environmental Rights Institute at Widener University Delaware Law School, and former Chief Sustainability Officer and Presidential Cabinet Member at Widener University. In 1996, he brought among the first lawsuits to enforce Pennsylvania's Green Amendment, has assisted in efforts to recognize environmental rights in Maryland, Delaware, and elsewhere in the US and multiple countries globally, and has provided representation in numerous climate cases. May has published extensively about environmental, constitutional, and human rights law, including in ELI's Principles of Constitutional Environmental Law in 2011. He spearheaded the effort that led to the American Bar Association adopting a resolution to advance environmental justice in 2021, and currently serves as the special legal advisor to the American Bar Association Task Force on Environmental Justice. Then finally, uh, Jonathan Adler is the Johann Verhey Memorial Professor of Law here at Case Western. He's also the director of the Coleman P. Burke Center for Environmental Law at the law school. Um, he's the author editor of eight books now. He teaches courses in environmental, administrative, and constitutional law. And his articles have appeared in publications ranging from the Harvard Environmental Law Review, the Yale Journal on Regulation, to the Wall Street Journal and New York Times. He's testified before Congress a dozen times, and his work has been cited by the United States Supreme Court. So with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Kanner on Zoom. Good afternoon, um, and thank you for having me. Thank you for that introduction, Cassandra. Um, 
and I want to thank Case Western for hosting this important conference. Um, and I want to apologize for not being there in person, but uh, a family matter came up. And I apologize to my fellow panelists for not spending some time with them last night. Um, so I've been involved in climate litigation for about five or six years, primarily uh, with Conservation Law Foundation uh, to try to hold um, various companies uh, accountable. That's probably the re you know that's probably the reason I was invited here today. Um, the Saban Center has you know done an extensive review of climate litigation that I highly recommend to everybody. And they talk about my cases there. Um, the only footnote I would I would give them is that um, we got the Gulf case reversed, uh, so we've won all of them so far on motions to dismiss, but not not on the merits. Um, but I don't want to talk about that um, because it's sort of been written up. People, people are aware of it. Um, when I started looking at the issue, oh, short answer, yes, you can sue corporations. Um, uh, when I started looking at this, it reminded me of so many things I'd seen in 40 years practicing law. Um, law, litigation law is very hard when you're dealing with novel problems. And that's really the what I tried to focus my article on, to try to bring some ideas from the past. Um, why, why is the law so uh, reluctant to accept novel arguments? Um, you know, one of the reasons is we're all essentially legal positivists, uh, which means that the law, that we don't like judges exercising discretion in making law, they should just be applying the law. The legislature makes law. Um, and that's kind of the tradition we have here in the United States. Um, and I think that in my experience, I found that there are ways of dealing with that. I'll give you two examples real quickly. Um, so I handled the original Three Mile Island litigation uh, in a number of dump site cases. Um, in Three Mile Island, the whole issue is people have been exposed to radiation, uh, but likely not injured until long in the future, uh, a latent injury. And there really wasn't a frame for handling that. In fact, the law was pretty um, clear that they wanted a manifest concrete injury. And that was the dominant paradigm. Um, so you have to convince the courts, especially a conservative court in the Middle District of Pennsylvania, um, to award, allow people to sue for medical monitoring, by which we meant, okay, you've been exposed to radiation, we will get some money so that annually you can come in for tests that doctors recommend to early detect cancers of various types. And what we did in that case, it was very simple. Um, really, we created an analogy um, to an auto accident. And I said to the judge, who'd been a state court judge, who was a federal judge then, um, well, if somebody's in an auto accident and they're rushed to the hospital and an x-ray is taken, but nothing was broken, the defendant still has to pay for the x-ray. You don't need an injury. Um, she, she accepted that as a valid tort idea and then entered an opinion, landmark opinion, granting medical monitoring to a class of people within a 25 mile radius of Three Mile Island. And that's kind of a factual analogy. You, you, you're trying to teach a judge to see something like something that they're comfortable with. Uh, but there are also like legal examples or legal relations. Um, shortly after Ronald Reagan got elected president, um, he decided to end all farm loans, basically. And they were foreclosing on everybody all over the United States. There's a, there's a movie that talks about this case. It's called Country um, with Jessica Lange and Sam Shepard. Um, and there, um, it, was, it was a loan program. And we tried to create a legal analogy there to something that the judge could understand. And what we said is, this is, this is not a loan program. It's really a welfare program. And 
you know, there was a lot of legislative history suggesting that, you know, the farm home loan uh, program was a welfare program of sorts uh, to help, you know, started during the, the agrarian revolution in the progressive era. Um, and but once we convince the judge to see it more as a welfare program that is a bank loan program, immediately we were able to say, well, look at Goldberg versus Kelly. You can't foreclose on people without giving them a hearing. And suddenly, all the, you know, he accepted that, granted it's a national class action, joined all farm foreclosures. During the time that the government was trying to figure out how to have hold hearings, um, legislatures were able to come in and sort of fix the problem, but we saved a lot of family farms in the process. That would be more of a sort of legal relation kind of analogy. Both of these are, are instructive in the sense that you have to take something very foreign and make it uh, simple. And so the real challenge, I think, is dealing with how we frame these issues. Um, I don't think that we have figured out in the United States the appropriate frame. There are a lot of, lot of contenders out there. Human rights is a contender. Public trust talk is, is a contender. I've written an article in uh, the Oregon Law Review on... Um, you know, tortious interference uh, and public trust doctrine, combining the two to use them in climate change. Um, uh, uh, Under human rights, we filed, I I did an article in Loyola on environmental justice and how it can also uh, be used in some of these cases. But so you've got human rights, you've got tort, tort, and you got tort law, you got public trust, You also have uh, consumer fraud, um, or as I call it, fraud, um, about companies who who just lied and misrepresented. Um, It appears in Europe, when you look at a case like Urgenta, that they are swiftly moving to a consensus on human rights as their paradigm for advancing these cases. Um, In the U.S., that seems to be running sort of in last place after Juliana, though the recent held decision in Montana state court suggests that there may still be some life in, in that theory here in the States. Um, uh, there's, uh, there, we've gone through a couple of waves of litigation. I think the first couple of waves were primarily tort cases. A lot of those died because of things like preemption. Um, and the, I would probably recommend to, to people, um, you know, Lewis and Clark did a national report, uh, reporters report for the United States, looking at three successive waves of litigation. The first wave mostly died on preemption, um, type arguments. Um, the second wave has been state governments suing, um, corporations for climate change, um, and they're using mostly tort theories. A couple of states have now added things like, um, you know, greenwashing, consumer fraud. There's some pretty robust statutes out there. Um, Others have have added public trust doctrine uh, ideas to the mix. Um, And right now there's, there's a great deal of struggle between those different theories We're we're going to learn a lot more now that the jurisdictional issues of what Lewis and Clark called the second wave of litigation have been dealt with. Uh, The third wave is has is described as more eclectic state constitutions, the held case as opposed to federal uh, constitutions. Um, uh, Our case uh, is based on the Clean Water Act. Um, Essentially, a lot of the permits have been written for these polluting facilities based on a little bit of rain a lot of times during the year. And one of the things we find in New England with climate change is it rains less, but a whole lot more. And most of these facilities uh, and in neighboring environmental justice communities um, haven't dealt with this. And so we're trying to force them to, to um, admit that there's a problem and that they have to do a solu- that they have to start fixing it, which we view as sort of a partial uh, effort 
to change behavior and to educate the public. Uh, if people, you know, I think one of the earlier speakers today was talking about the role of litigation in educating the public and maybe galvanizing political change. Um, I think that that's probably going to be fairly important in the scheme of things um, down the road. Um, other than that, um, you know, framing should just be, you know, is about strategy. Um, I don't think there is domestically a single strategy. I think it's very helpful that this panel is looking at numerous alternatives. But when you pick an alternative, I think it's important to say, how do I sell that to judges who are relatively adverse to the creation of novel claims? And so I say it's not just a doctrinal problem. It's a strategy problem. Um, so thank you, and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions at the end. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'd like to thank all the organizers and uh, the editors of the Journal of International Law, as well as Professor Burke specifically, um, for having me here. Uh, the title of my talk is Fossil Fuel Fraud. And in this talk, I'm attempting to answer, or at least to shed some light on, the following question. The question is this. Can fossil fuel companies that disseminated climate change disinformation be liable for fraud. Now, I'm talking here about the climate change disinformation campaign that was carried out for a couple of decades, and I wanted to say a couple words about the question that I'm posing. Number one is the scope of it is quite narrow. I'm only focusing on fraud and not many of the other claims that have been historically brought in this space, such as negligence, nuisance, trespass, and what have you. I'm looking at fraud claims. Um, which is my area of expertise, and also it's something that's becoming more and more prevalent in the claims that we're seeing against fossil fuel companies. And the second thing I wanted to kind of uh, clarify about this question is the word disinformation. It's not a great word. Uh, it's open to a lot of wide interpretation, but the disinformation that I'm talking about, which I think most people would probably just naturally understand it to be, is this is... Uh, information that is purposely false, that is meant to deceive, and that is not accidentally just wrong or false, but rather it's, it, it, it's purposeful in nature, for nature and that it's purposely trying to um, convince people to believe something that the speaker knows is false or is recklessly disseminating it, not, notwithstanding the fact that it's false. Now, I think that this question is particularly relevant right now at this point in time because we've seen these fraud claims emerging in climate change litigation, particularly in the past few years. Um, it started really following the 2014 and 2015 invest investigative reports revealing just how much the fossil fuel industry really knew, starting with Exxon, but then spreading to other corporations. And it's kind of like the more we know, the worse it gets. Uh, we know what they knew and it was totally at odds with what they were telling the public. And so what we're seeing is more and more claims that incorporate common law fraud or some sort of consumer fraud claim. And then, of course, there's securities fraud and other fraud, fraud law species claims coming along. So there's just uh, five claims up here on the five lawsuits up here on the, uh, on the, on the slide. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go through them because we don't have time to, but each of them alleges either common law fraud, consumer fraud, or some combination of the two. Now, I'm speaking about what the fossil fuel industry did as fraudulent because knowing what I have seen, I personally believe it was fraudulent. Does that mean that it meets the elements of civil fraud or criminal fraud? Well, that has to be borne out 
at, at, at trial. So the, the evidence has to be brought, the elements have to be met, but if we look at the essence of what went on, what was the nature of the public messaging campaign of these fossil fuel companies? Well, we know that they knew that what they were saying was false. They spread the, dissem they disseminated the disinformation to the public purposefully with the intent to convince people to buy into the falsehood, to bottom their own, uh, to further their own bottom line and essentially to make money. So these, this fraudulent campaign worked the way that any other fraud claim works. Uh, but plaintiffs seeking fraud claims against fossil fuel companies runs up against uh, something that Alan Canner was just talking about. It's very novel. You don't usually see fraud claims in this way against uh, companies or industries that are disseminating these fraudulent claims to the public at large rather than one-on-one um, -on -one or individual transactions, which is how fraud is usually thought of. And so Plaintiffs bringing these claims against these fossil fuel companies, many of them in active litigation right now, they're gonna be running up against a number of hurdles, um, some of them common to these fossil fuel claims like standing, political question, preemption. But then there's also some hurdles that they're gonna have to get over that are very particular to fraud claims in particular. One is the First Amendment. Uh, and the other is how the fraud laws are written and applied. So why is the First Amendment gonna be such a problem? Well, any time that you're bringing a claim to impose liability on a defendant for spreading a message out to the public, as false as it may be, that defendant is going to raise the First Amendment as a defense, and the First Amendment is a very strong defense to such claims. Uh, we, we're gonna, right now, most of these claims are kind of bouncing back and forth between state and federal courts, and so it's going through these procedural back and forths, but the First Amendment is, gonna, is, is going to end up being a very strong uh, defense that, that'll be raised. And when these fossil fuel companies raise the First Amendment defense, um, most often what we have seen is when disinformation is defended on First Amendment grounds, what the Supreme Court has generally interpreted as as some sort of attempt to hold defendants liable for false speech. And so false speech is the label that gets applied to disinformation claims, such as the fossil fuel um, industry's campaign for climate change denial. So false speech claims, um, I won't go through each of these cases in detail, but the bottom line is Alvarez is the most recent uh, major, major false speech law set forth by the Supreme Court, where the Supreme Court made very clear uh, there was no majority opinion, but the majority judgment said uh, false speech is not protected speech. And so if you are trying to hold a defendant liable for, s for spreading falsehoods, we're going to call it false speech, and false speech is protected. Now, in the Washlight case that came along a couple years later, the court there dismissed the plaintiff's claims against Fox News uh, for allegedly violating consumer protection laws in Washington, for downplaying the danger posed by COVID, describing the pandemic as a hoax, and accusing government officials and media organizations of exaggerating the dangers posed by COVID. And the court there held that the First Amendment bars the plaintiff's claims against Fox News. Why? Well, because first off, the speech at issue was a matter of public interest. And when the speech is a matter of public interest, it has the most robust speech protections. And secondly, the court pointed to Alvarez and said, remember, f uh, false speech is not unprotected. It doesn't fit any, into any of those unprotected categories like uh, obscenity, true threats, defamation, or any of those. And so the court in Washlight said, and I quote, uh, 
false statements about threats to public health, even if made falsely or recklessly, do not fall within any exception to the First Amendment. And that brings us to just earlier this year in the Rodriguez Cotto case. So this past March 31st, the federal district court in Puerto Rico struck down a law that made it a crime to knowingly and purposefully spread falsehoods about ongoing emergencies or disasters like hurricanes, where the falsehoods, quote, put the life, health, bodily integrity, or safety of one or more persons at imminent risk. The judge there, relying on Alvarez, said this is an, uh, an invalid restriction on protected speech. Once again, it's speech on a matter of public interest. It has the most robust protections. And the judge there also echoed a sentiment that is widely embraced by the Supreme Court, which is that the solution for false speech is not clamping down on speech, it's more speech. And so this is kind of where we're at on trying to hold defendants liable for spreading harmful disinformation. Uh, you have the Alvarez, Washlight, and Rodriguez Cotto case, and what we see is this disinformation is generally considered false speech, which means it's protected. And if it's protected speech, it's going to be virtually impossible, probably completely impossible, because it's protected speech, and you cannot hold fossil fuel companies liable for exercising their protected speech. If, however, this harmful disinformation that's being spread is, is deemed not protected speech, but some sort of unprotected category, then that might change the analysis. In fact, it could change it quite a bit. And so that goes into, well, what category could it be other than false speech? Um, I argue that much of it is not just false, but it's fraudulent because it works the same way as any other fraud. So let's go to the fraud elements. This is a, the, the common law fraud elements, widely reflected in, um, in criminal law fraud as well, as well as to some extent in consumer fraud. So false representation, material intent to induce, plaintiff relied, justifiable reliance. Well, what you notice about the way that the fraud claim is set up is it's premised on some sort of one-on-one -on -one interaction. It, 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 it views the fraudulent wrongdoing in sort of a one-on-one -on -one dynamic, which is how fraud law developed. Fraud law goes back 250 years. And most of the transactions where fraud was taking place over that time were indeed one-on-one -on -one because there was no electronic communication. Indeed, there was no mass communication whatsoever. The world has changed a lot in the past 100 years with TV and radio, and then now just in the past 20 years with social media and the digital world we live in where falsehoods are being pumped out at, at an extraordinary rate. And so do we still need to limit fraud to this archaic sort of one-on-one -on -one, uh, cause of action that has developed since the 1700s. Um, I'm, 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 I'm uh, pointing with these red arrows to the elements that are particularly problematic from a uh, fossil fuel disinformation perspective. Intent to induce reliance, plaintiff justifiably relied. Well, these things are very difficult to show when uh, a plaintiff is damaged through climate change, ultimately because these fossil fuel companies, their falsehoods allowed that climate change to happen in the first place. But how do you causally tie it in? And that goes to resulting damages. Well, the damages generally have to be causally connected to the reliance that the plaintiff uh, engaged in. So then it kind of begs the question, why, are, why is Professor Henriksen, or anybody, talking about climate change uh, doubt campaign and disinformation on one hand and fraud on the other. Like, why do these things go together at all? Well, there's actually a laundry list of reasons why I think that we should be talking about them in the same breath. I'm just going to touch on three really quickly here. Um, false speech does not reflect what kind of speech we're worried about when it comes to the fossil fuel disinformation campaign. The problem is not that it's false. People can say things and be wrong. You don't have to always be factually true with what you say. The problem is that it was in bad faith, that it was purposefully false, and that makes it uh, 
uh, purposely harmful at the end of the day because it's, it's a knowing uh, placing other people at risk. Uh, the second reason is, oh, so at, at bottom then, it, it's a fraud scheme that works just like any one-on-one -on -one fraud. Just because it's aimed at the public at large doesn't make it not fraudulent. Uh, the second reason is that the, the fraud exception to the First Amendment, it's already been applied to fraud on the public in numerous ways, although each of them narrow in and of themselves. We've seen it in the tobacco cases, asbestos cases. In some of those cases, in some jurisdictions, courts have been willing to apply this fraud on the public uh, element to fraud claims against those industries. Also, securities fraud is often fraud on the public, and no one really questions why we're applying fraud in that context. And consumer protection laws that prohibit deceptive and fraudulent business practices, similar thing. And the third reason that I think we should approach disinformation as a fraud problem um, is that in this new, what's called sometimes the cheap, cheap speech world that we live in, where it's so easy to spread falsehoods for one's own self-serving purposes and manipulate public opinion, manipulate people's ideas uh, about, about climate change and about many other uh, topics, important topics, there has, there's a laundry list of scholars that are talking about this problem and saying it's unsustainable, we have to do something, but there's no solution really gotten to yet. Well, I say the solution, or at least part of it, is to stop thinking about this as false speech and start moving it into fraudulent speech. And so there's my kind of two aims, and now I'm just wrapping it up here. So aim number one is I think I would like to see the discussion on climate change disinformation move from false speech to fraud speech. And secondly, these fraud on the public schemes should be treated the exact same as one-on-one -on -one fraud schemes. They shouldn't be given a pass just because they're aimed at a larger number of people. So if we, if we do these two things, then at least I believe the answer to my overarching question may very well be yes, fossil fuel companies that disseminated climate change disinformation likely can be liable for fraud. So that's it, thank you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah, it's coming to the end of a, of a, of a wonderful conference. Thank you so much, um, Case Western Reserve School of Law. It, it, you know, this has been a terrific opportunity to hear from a bunch of different perspectives about what to do about climate change. I mean, really, look, it's, it's a big deal, right? And no one really knows what to do. I don't pretend to know what to do. But I have some thoughts about what possibly can be done and what can't be done, which gives you a glimpse into what my perspective might be about the question that's been asked, which is can corporations be held to account for climate change? Um, not much. Okay, hold on. There's hope, right? There's, there, but let me start with um, uh, Oppenheimer. Who saw Oppenheimer? Me too. All right, you know, terrific movie and all that. Some parts of it I didn't really understand why they were in it, but okay. Uh, <laughs> And maybe, I mean, it appealed to the engineer in me, but uh, other parts, you know, come on, let's get through the drama. Let's get to the engineering parts, the scientific parts. But do uh, you remember the parts with Edward Teller? <clears throat> Edward Teller, does that ring a bell? So Edward Teller, good, great, is, the, is known as the parent of the hydrogen bomb. So he was advocating for a hydrogen bomb there in Los Alamos when uh, the, the scientists there in Oppen Oppenheimer were trying to develop a different kind of bomb, a super bomb. Well, he got his way in 1953, but it took a little while. And he was uh, really an antagonist to J. Robert Oppenheimer um, for the reasons the, the movie explains. And was no friend to the environment or humanity or human, human rights, but a brilliant person, you know, just absolutely brilliant. Uh, well, why do I mention that? Well, let me read something to you, if I could. So this is from 1959, and I'm drawing this from an, uh, a chapter that Professor Katie Q and I just wrote for Democracy in a Hotter World, a, a book by David Orr. So fossil fuels were the toast of the town. 
For its centennial in 1959, the American Petroleum Institute threw itself a party at Columbia University in New York City called Energy and Man. All the big oil, big wigs were there, representing most worldwide fossil fuel production. The celebration culminated with a not-to-be-missed keynote speech by, who do you think? Edward Teller, right? Uh, Edward Teller, a political conservative largely credited with being the father of the hydrogen bomb. A celebrated scientist, Time Magazine named Teller a man of the year in 1960. It was a standing room only event. But to everyone's astonishment, Teller wasn't in a cheering mood and after clearing his throat, <clears throat> he said, ladies and gentlemen, I'm to talk to you about energy in the future. This, strangely, is the question of contaminating the atmosphere. Whenever you burn conventional fuel, you create carbon dioxide. Could I remind, this is 1959. Elvis is just not even in the army yet. The carbon dioxide is invisible, Teller goes on. It is transparent. You can't smell it. It's not dangerous to health. So why should you worry about it? Well. That was 1959 when CO2 loadings were about 9 billion metric tons a year, less than one quarter of what they are now today. Uh, in addition, since 1959, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, as we've heard, has increased dramatically you know, from 315 to 420 parts per million. And the Earth's average temperature has risen to 58 degrees from 51 Fahrenheit. I mean, that's astounding. Nothing like that has occurred on human, in human record. So Teller continued, back to Teller. Carbon dioxide, again, this is, these are his words, not mine. Carbon dioxide has a strange property. It transmits visible light, but it absorbs the infrared radiation which is emitted from the Earth. Its presence in the atmosphere causes a greenhouse effect. Edward Teller. It's been calculated that a temperature rise corresponding to a 10% increase in carbon dioxide will be sufficient to melt the ice cap, and submerged New York. All the coastal cities would be covered, and since a considerable percentage of the human race lives in coastal regions, I think that this chemical contamination is more serious than most people tend to believe. I wasn't born yet. It would be another three years. Um, and I'm here to talk to you about climate litigation now. Uh, and first, some numbers. Sorry, again, I'm, I'm, I'm showing, you know, where I came from, sort of. You know, first the numbers. And these are largely based upon the Sabin report that just came out, you know, Michael Berger and Michael Gerard and everybody else, you know, fantastic. And another study from Joanne Setzer um, and her colleague Catherine uh, Hyam and others. So 100 companies are responsible is the conclusion for about 71% of global greenhouse gas emissions since 1977. 100 companies, 47 companies, only 47 account for 60%, only 25. And I didn't even know about all those super rich, all that stuff that's going on with super rich. Goodness gracious, really. How, how, how can you live like that? 25 companies, I mean pretty well, right? 25 companies are responsible for 50% and five for 25 percent. So those companies are oil and gas, sure, coal, but also steel, cement, and chemical companies. And what we see is that you know there's a response. We're lawyers, we're law professors, we're legal academics, we're law students. We want to you know do something, right? I get it. We were all there for those of you who are students and want to do something. We did too. We do too. So there have been in my lifetime. Uh, nearly 3,000 lawsuits about the climate by the Sabin Center count somewhere around 2,800. Uh, about, that's worldwide, about 2,000 in the U.S. And I, I feel like I've been involved in 1,995 or something. About 800 elsewhere, 400 in South America, 285 in Europe. Okay, those are just numbers, but here you go. Only a fraction of those 3,000 cases have been brought against companies. Vast majority against governments, okay? So we're here to talk about companies. So I won't talk about all the cases about or involving governments. 
you know, like held and so on, right? So only a fraction. Um, and of those, a small fraction, about 10%, are about bringing what you might think of as climate rights kinds of cases against those companies. And so we're talking about this question about can companies be sued? I mean, it's a curious question to be asking in 2023 when we look at the evidence. Uh, even though there's you know, energy and enthusiasm about it, it, it just hasn't happened much in the scheme of things, considering there are you know, five companies responsible for 25% of all the CO2. And if those companies you know, we took, we washed away all that CO2 from the atmosphere, there wouldn't be climate change. But here we go. So by the results, um, uh, what about these cases? So it's kind of slim pickings, but all around the globe, there have been lawsuits to address climate change. One of the first was in Nigeria, the BEMRE case. It's spelled G-B-E-M-R-E. I've written about it, but it's BEMRE. And uh, a farmer looking out for his family and his, uh, his cattle brought a lawsuit against, yeah, you got a shell, to get them to stop flaring off all the methane that they were flaring off. You see, when you take hydrocarbons from the ground, it comes in two forms, primarily liquid and gas. The liquid you can transport, it's liquid already. You warm it up a little bit to speed it along, but gas you've gotta compress, and you gotta chill, and you gotta, it's harder. So what do you do if your shell in the middle of the Niger Delta? You burn it. So upwards of 40%, 40% of all the methane produced on the African continent is just burned. And so it was affecting you know, local areas. So this person, he, he, he talked to Shell. He, he met with them. He said, hey, you know, it's hurting my kids. My, and, and they said, you know, thank you. So he brought a lawsuit, and he won. Now, Nigeria at the time didn't have a right to a healthy environment provision, but it did have a right to dignity. It does have a right to dignity in the Constitution. That was the sweet spot. And the court found that Shell's emissions violated a right to dignity under the Nigerian Constitution and ordered Shell to stop which of course Shell abided by, and we don't have climate change. And everybody's, no, no, the judge at the high court who issued that case was reassigned. The files were lost. Shell didn't comply. Um, but we have, hold on again, there are silver linings, recent ones, right? We live and we learn. The Mealy Defense case versus Royal Dutch Shell, back to Shell. Um, the Hague District Court in the Netherlands ordering Shell to reduce emissions by 2030 by 45% globally, still Shell. It's on appeal, you know, is Shell complying? I'll leave that to you. Human Rights Commission in the Philippines, after a four-year investigation issued, is that remaining or, okay, issued a report finding that 47 carbon majors accounted for, accounting for 21% of all emissions. They knew. I mean, they knew. They investigated. They knew. They lied. They concealed. They caused. Um, and so it was a, a trial, if you will, uh, about causes and effects with these companies that we're talking about. So there are other cases in the EU. Some of them have been addressed, so I won't. It's part of the benefit of being able to go next to last is that I, I, I can save you from repeating what you've heard. But there are other cases against companies largely on the fraud side of it in Europe. Um, you may wonder, what about the US? Well, for people, uh, not states, not governments, but for people, there's, there's really no suing uh, companies for climate change. OK, right? You're thinking, well, that's not right. There's this and there. Well, um, lawsuits that have been brought by people, by communities, have been thrown out of federal court on a variety of grounds. All those things pretty much I teach in civil procedure and constitutional law have come back to shut those cases down. So the American Electric Power case, a case I worked on, went to the Supreme Court. That was brought by states. But the Supreme Court found that pub federal public nuisance claims are displaced by the Clean Air Act, whether uh, an administration implements the Clean Air Act or not. Uh, and I'm sorry, say, no, I, it's hard to even say, but Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg said that. So what the effect that had was that people who just wanted to bring lawsuits against companies because of their crop failures or because of hurricanes or you fill in the blank. No, the federal court said, Ninth Circuit said in the Kivalina case, no, you know, it's displaced. Also, state claims for state public nuisance, they're either preempted or 
they're forbidden or prohibited by the, your friend and mine, the political question doctrine, right? Or they shouldn't be in state court under the, this doctrine of forum nonconvenience. They should be litigated someplace else. You get the idea. Um, but look what's been happening. And Alan Cantor talked about some of these. So just by the numbers. In the last, well, since my kids were in high school, not too long ago, eight states have filed lawsuits against uh, companies, 36 municipalities. And I'm, not, I'm just counting Puerto Rico as one, but there are 16 municipalities that filed a really novel lawsuit recently, and the District of Columbia. So there are lawsuits brought by governments, not by, I mean, by people's representatives, but not by people, not by human, individual human beings, all across the country. Um, about, about 20 different lawsuits, including just you know, two weeks ago, today, the state of California, with the world's fifth largest economy, bringing a lawsuit against the five leading uh, contributors of greenhouse gas emissions. And then you heard about the Oregon case earlier as well. So these lawsuits are up against, th this is how I started, you know, that there are these obstacles these lawsuits are up against all of these obstacles. It doesn't mean they can't be brought. I mean, we're America. We can do anything, right? Including kill the planet. And the um, defenses, part of that is a product of the, the legal academy. Um, just off the top of my head, standing has washed away lots of climate lawsuits, no pun. The political question doctrine already mentioned. Um, the uh, take care clause, Article 2, preventing citizen suits to enforce um, laws. Pleading requirements under Rule 12b-6, throwing out you know, this plausibility requirement. Um, the uh, uh, um, uh, inter uh, move for interlocutory review, it's more common in climate cases for the writ of mandamus against C. Juliana. And then removal, remember, did we even, did you even, do we teach, do we learn removal? I mean, I do teach it, but, you know, it's kind of comes and goes. Uh, because these companies don't want to be in state court. They want to be in federal court. Uh, but the Supreme Court said over the summer, well, you know, these cases should be in state court. And then at the state level, besides preemption and political question doctrine and forum nonconvenience, you have other state bars to litigation, a whole variety. Um, which brings me to where I come from, where I teach anyway, is in Delaware. You heard of it? You've been there? Raise your hand if you've been to Delaware. I don't mean driving through it. I mean, but, okay, good, thank you, by the way. You were the first state, had the first modern constitution. We had a couple of good years, 230 ago, right? So Delaware, I'm gonna pay for that. Delaware, I, I love Delaware, I'm kidding. But you know, um, those companies that we're talking about, guess where they are incorporated. And Delaware corporate law provides shields and protects those companies against liability under uh, uh, the business practice rule and fiduciary responsibilities to shareholders. Their job is to make money. It's not to promote human rights. Now, I'm not saying company, please hear me, I'm not saying companies shouldn't or it's not best for the company's bottom dollar as we heard about earlier today, but you know, Delaware law, mm -mm, you know, you can go make money. That's your job. But there is this one provision, again, kind of a silver lining, to create a conversation about corporate responsibility, bringing us back to the thesis for this panel. There's a, a, a seldom used, I can't find anything, every, section 284, the Delaware um, uh, general corporate law, that permits the attorney general of the state of Delaware, and that's an elected position, to petition the Court of Chancery. It has that weird name to it. It's, there are courts of equity and law in Delaware. It goes back a long time ago. Ask me during a break or later if you want. But to petition the Court of Chancery, which oversees Delaware law, to remove or suspend corporate charters um, for acting in ways that are fraudulent or violate other norms and laws. So. That might be a place to look about whether corporate, corporations can be held to account, you know, getting shareholders and the public involved in that conversation. But thank you so much. I think it's a great question. I wish I had a better answer, uh, but it's, it's really interesting to hear uh, perspectives. Thanks so much. Thank you so much.
thank you all for being here, for hanging it out to the end. I have the, the, the honor or pleasure or responsibility of being the last speaker on a Friday afternoon. And I was told by Andre that part of my responsibility was to generate some disagreement or some pushback on the panel, which I'll try to do, but uh, I actually agree with a lot of, of what's been said. Um, but what I want to talk about briefly is, and this is, I think, some agreement with what we've already heard, is if we think about the question for the panel, can you sue corporations? Well, of course, the answer is you can. Um, we can sue anybody. Um, that's really not the question we ask. Uh, can you file the lawsuit? The, the real questions are, well, can you win? And as we've heard some, and I'll talk about a little bit more, um, the answer is sometimes. Uh, it right? depends on um, the nature of the claim you bring. And I want to talk a little bit about what we're learning about what sorts of claims uh, you can bring and you can't. Um, but I then want to take a little bit of time to talk about what I think is actually the bigger question, which is, do lawsuits against corporations actually help get us where we want to be, which is closer to solving the challenge posed by climate change? And there, I'm, I'm not sure uh, what the answer is. I mean, certainly if our goal is to have bad guys and villains and to punish them, well, sure. Uh, but if the goal is to stabilize atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases so that warming slows or stops, um, stops eventually because some amount of it is in the system no, pretty much no matter what we do, well, that's a more challenging question. Uh, as we talk about in a wide range of classes, when we think about the role that the law should play, we recognize that solving a problem and exacting retribution don't always align. Uh, and when we think about what we want the law to do, uh, we have to keep that in mind. Now, I, I'm a domestic regulatory guy, so I'm not going to say a ton about international law, and I apologize for that. Michael knew that when... Um, he asked me to, to be a part of this. Um, but I want to say a little bit about what we, what we know about domestic litigation uh, against corporations uh, here in the United States, in part because here is where most of the litigation is, um, and um, because we've learned a lot about what sorts of um, litigation should be allowed to go forward. And, and I think, at least based on, on current doctrine, um, Courts have actually been, been getting uh, some of the bigger questions right, um, both in cases that they've um, not allowed to go forward. And, and I'm sorry, Jimmy, I, I do think that Ruth Bader Ginsburg was correct as a doctrinal matter, although I think the underlying precedents are themselves problematic. But, but I think she did apply them properly. Um, but that what we're seeing now in the, in the litigation in state courts that the Supreme Court has, surprisingly to some, thus far refused to get involved in uh, is also correct. Uh, and that if we think about um, the historical context in which this, this litigation arises, and in particular, the historical development of environmental law in this country, we can actually understand why both of these things are. Um, we tend to overlook sometimes or forget that environmental law uh, began uh, not at the national level, not with the burst of legislation in the late 60s and 1970s enacted in Washington, D.C., uh, but began at the local level. In the common law tradition, it began with cases like William Aldred's case, where William Aldred was really upset about the guy raising too many pigs next door in the early 17th century. And the court said, when you use your property, you have to use it in a way that doesn't infringe upon the ability of other people to also make use of their property. And if you go back and read the case, the parts of the case that aren't in Latin, because as an early 17th century uh, British common law case, <laughs> uh, a terrible amount of it is in Latin, um, you actually see arguments we're used to seeing. Oh, that, that Aldred, you know, his nose is just too sensitive. I am doing something important for the community. I am raising pigs. I am feeding people. I am being productive. His peculiar tastes, his sensitivity shouldn't get, shouldn't get in the way of my producing these things of economic value. And the court says, no, that's not how it works. You can use your property in a way so as not to harm your neighbor. 
It doesn't matter that you think, or perhaps the community might think that what you're doing is more valuable. In the United States, that was, those principles were embodied in early uh, common law nuisance cases, primarily private nuisance cases, uh, but ultimately public nuisance cases as well when we were dealing with problems that weren't one property owner against their neighbor, but air pollution, water pollution, and the like that affected the broader community. And if you look at the history in this country, the idea that litigation is somehow completely apart from other exercises of the police power at the local level, like regulation and legislation, th that really wasn't the conception. The understanding was the local government had the police power, and sometimes it would go to court, and sometimes it would enact legislation defining a public nuisance ex ante and, and prohibiting that accordingly. If you look at, for example, the progressive smoke control movement, uh, which we often forget about, which did tremendous work in the early 20th century, dramatically improving urban air quality, Nuisance and regulation, especially place-based regulation, regulation talking about where facilities were allowed to be, were two parts of the same coin. Early zoning regulation is in large part justified and understood as being about nuisances. As we know from uh, uh, the history of cases uh, uh, up the street, that's that, that, that justification ended up being used to um, uh, excuse all sorts of other things, but the underlying theory was that that's what we were doing. And so it should, it, in some respects, if we're, or I should say, this was the, the history of our environmental regulation, and it didn't matter uh, if uh, the, right, the, the problem was particularly localized or if it spread. If you could demonstrate the source, you could show the attribution. Um, action could be brought either through efforts to privately vindicate rights or through governmental entities that were entrusted with the authority to act on behalf of the public. Now, when we adopted a bunch of federal environmental regulation, the assumption ended up being, or the assumption the Supreme Court was convinced of in some Clean Water Act litigation in the 70s was that, well, that displaces the ability to do this at the federal level. And that's a long story that we don't have time for. Um, it, re it requires talking about things like the Erie Doctrine and Claxon and all, and, 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 and why some of those cases might actually have been a mistake. And again, we can, we'll save that for another time. Um, but the idea basically was that um, federal courts don't do common law, state courts do common law, and if Congress has provided another rule for decision through statute, um, we don't need federal common law causes of action. And so federal environmental legislation displaced, didn't preempt, displaced, pushed out of the way other sources of federal remedies. But if you look at federal environmental legislation, it did not do that. It did not preempt state authority. It left state regulatory programs largely in place. It left state ability to use tort law as one of the many tools in the toolbox to deal with environmental problems in place. And the statutes were, relative, were fairly clear about that. And they, where they meant to make exceptions, they were explicit about that, largely in the context of things like product regulation. Some of the environmental statutes are explicit about what's preempted but otherwise um, left, uh, left state law uh, as they found it. So I think when you look at some of the federal or some of the climate litigation against corporations in the United States, we see both of these things replicated. When um, Connecticut and other states sued American Electric Power under federal common law, um, the courts ultimately concluded, again, I think consistent with the doctrine as it developed in the 1970s, that there was no federal common law cause of action uh, left, that that had been displaced. Um, but uh, as Justice Ginsburg said in her opinion in American Electric Power, um, the state law question was a separate question. And in recent years, various governments, mostly local governments, have filed a range of claims primarily in state court. There's one exception of one case that was filed in federal court, which was a mistake, um, uh, uh, but that these cases were filed in state court making state law claims and therefore were not displaced, were not affected by American electric power, and thus far, every federal appellate court asked to remove those cases or to approve the removal of those cases to federal court on complete preemption grounds has said no, um, and has said no in ways that strongly suggest that any sort of preemption argument against these cases 
um, uh, doesn't have uh, much grounding. The one exception is the Second Circuit, where um, the preemption claim was was presented to a case that had been filed making state law claims in federal court as an initial instant. So these cases can go forward, and they are going forward. Um, uh, but there will, of course, be more procedural wrangling. Uh, the oil company defendants will get another bite at the apple in terms of trying to make these cases go away. Um, well, so will these cases succeed? Maybe, but it also depends on what we mean by will they succeed. They're going to face a bunch of problems, not about whether or not you can sue, but really about how broad is your suit? What remedies can you ask for? What degree of, of activities can you um, uh, blame uh, on, uh, blame various consequences on? Um, there are jurisdictional limits on the application of state law to activities that occur outside of states, limits on the ability of state courts to sanction conduct uh, outside of their jurisdiction, and we will likely see a lot of litigation on that. Um, Helping the plaintiffs is that we currently have a Supreme Court that is increasingly skeptical of preemption, largely on federalism grounds, um, both the more liberal justices and, and half of the more conservative justices are skeptical of preemption. But at the same time, we have a court that has shown itself very skeptical of entrepreneurial plaintiffs litigation a court very skeptical of litigators coming up with new theories, new ways of suing that have not been expressly authorized by the legislatures. And so one question we, we have to ask is, you know, which of these tendencies is, is going to prevail if these cases go forward? But I think we're gonna have to ask, what's the goal? Now for a lot of the communities that are suing, the goal is at least in part a compensation for the costs that local communities are bearing in terms of having to deal with climate consequences. I don't know if folks have seen the videos from Brooklyn this morning, um, uh, the flooding of LaGuardia Airport, Terminal A, among other things. Um, a lot of cities, a lot of part places um, are gonna have to spend a lot of money uh, to adapt to climate related and other changes, particularly as it relates to infrastructure and certainly some, in one respect these suits are about uh, helping pay those bills. And that's worthwhile, right? We definitely think tort litigation is, is about making people responsible for harms, responsible for harms financially, making them pay the bill. Uh, but will that drive greenhouse gas reductions? Suits about past harms and compensating for past harms? Maybe. Um, but these suits are largely seeking compensation, not injunctions. Uh, will penalize firms that have done the actions yesterday, not necessarily those who are responsible going forward. U.S. Uh, firms are certainly responsible for the vast majority of, firm, of, of emissions that we've seen to date, um, but likely will not be going forward. The United States itself is now responsible for about, what, 11, 12% of annual emissions, um, uh, and um, as a share, it's going down. Now maybe one, would think, one goal we think of this litigation is actually to force policy change, to impose costs on industry so that it comes to the table, so that it makes a deal, so that it agrees to a carbon tax or it agrees to restrictions on emissions. And, and maybe it is, but here again, I think some caution is, is, is warranted. The example that people often point to is the tobacco litigation. The master settlement agreement among the tobacco companies with suits filed by state governments that resulted in massive payments to states and ultimately induced um, Philip Marks in particular to support federal tobacco legislation. This did impose costs on tobacco companies. It did give money to, to states that at least initially were pledged to tobacco reduction efforts, although um, very quickly, legislatures learned how to allocate that money to other things. Here in Ohio, it um, has often been used uh, so that we don't have to pay for smog check on our cars. Um, that's tobacco money that's paid for that, um, not for the purpose it was meant for. Um, and the structure of both the master settlement agreement and the ultimate legislation was designed in a way to cartelize the industry so the major tobacco firms would stay in business, continue to sell their products, and not face competition. And as it's worked out, um, the tobacco legislation is a very powerful tool against those who would like to make products uh, that are less deadly, 
uh, that help smokers quit more effectively than FDA approved uh, cessation technologies, uh, and that might otherwise um, prevent uh, the toll from tobacco from continuing. So a deal is possible, but if that's our model, if tobacco litigation is our model, I'm not sure we should be so happy about that. So in thinking about whether or not we, we can sue cor uh, corporations, again, the answer is yes, maybe. Um, and sometimes that'll win, and I think some of these state court, state suits uh, might end up being quite successful just as a question of litigation. But if the question is what will actually help us solve the problem of climate change, what will actually help us stabilize and ultimately reduce concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, I will confess I'm a lot less convinced that these are a tool um, that will actually help with, with that. Um, that's not a happy note to end um, uh, the last talk on the panel, but I'm out of time, so I can't say anything more optimistic, at least not yet, perhaps, uh, in the question and answer. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, with that, we will open it up to questions from the audience. Very brief. Very brief observation. Some 30 years ago, uh, when the Cleveland Browns decided to become the Baltimore Ravens, uh, they raised the defense in, in a lawsuit that they were incorporated in Delaware. And uh, the, the, the courts rejected, they said that uh, the Cleveland Browns were the Cleveland, Ohio Browns, and they would have to answer in Ohio courts. Uh, that's, I don't know uh, what great national significance that has, uh, but loyal Clevelanders, uh, uh, probably thought that the dog should have been let out on, on, on the late Mr. Brown. So on behalf of the state of Delaware, we'd like to apologize for the trauma that we put you through with the Browns moving to Baltimore, which is where I live now. Um, I don't think we, in Delaware we've allowed Art Modell to return either. Wait, was that too soon? <laughs> Sorry. All right, terrific panel. My question for you all is about the Dutch shell case in the Netherlands. So that's a 21 decision by the district court. It's on appeal. What are the implications of that case for the kinds of issues you've been talking about today? I'll look at it this time. Not much. Um, yeah, so not much. Uh, so the, you know, the, as we heard you know, with, the, with the wonderful uh, keynote from John Knox, there is a world of law out there that's inspiring um, and influential around human rights. But man, it took us a long time to get there. And by us, I mean you know, environmental advocates and those who are trying to address climate change, but we're getting there. So um, despite what I said earlier about you know, concerns of the, the reach of the law and holding corporations accountable, when we're looking for hope and inspiration and influence, uh, I mean, I have a 22 and a 25 year old man and you know, to talk to them about it, it's there. It, and it's to tell the truth. Okay, now hold on, I know that sounds dramatic, but. I mean, what happened? Why did we stop telling the truth about things? Um, I mean, maybe we always lied, but it just seems like it's so in vogue and so easy. But what trials do is to help tell the truth. So if there are trials, like what happened in the health case in Montana, which isn't about corporations, it's about you know, the state of Montana, or in the Netherlands case, or the Urgenda case, you know, that's not about companies, that's about the government. But if we can get to a trial, uh, with corporations, then that leads to truth, which leads to action. You know, we can't deny it any longer. We saw that in the cigarette manufacturing litigation. Uh, you know, we saw it with, uh, with opioids to some extent. Again, you might disagree with that, but, but there hasn't been a trial. I mean, a real trial. I mean, give me an opening statement. Witnesses, experts, jury. When we get to that point, it'll be harder to say, well, we can't do anything about it because Congress isn't holding hearings about climate change, so let's have courts do it. 
as Jonathan knows, I'm not a lawyer and I don't play one. I'm a biologist. Um, and I agree with Jonathan uh, that no amount of lawsuits is going to stop these companies. I mean, if you, if, if you look at uh, Purdue Pharma, if you look at Fox News, they just look at this amount of money as part of their cost of doing business. So as a non-lawyer, I've often wondered about this, and you've talked about this being fraud. Can the leaders of these companies, who are obviously creating lies, and if you read Naomi Aresis's book, The Merchants of Doubt, and more, more recently, the, the Igloo and the Parrot, not only is it, are they doing the same thing that the cigarette companies did, they're the same people who are doing the same thing, creating the same fraud, working for these people. Can't they do jail time for this? Instead of saying money, and I suspect that that might make them a little bit less, I mean, if, if it was like Enron or something like that, and you said, okay, we're, we're not gonna do this as, as taking funds away from you, can you make it that there's actually gonna be a personal um, cost to it? And like I say, I'm, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so there's probably a very good answer to that, but it's one thing I always wonder about. If, if there is a very good answer, I don't have it. But um, jail time, I don't know. What we're seeing is, what I've spent the last six or seven years looking at is ways that different individuals and organizations mislead the public in ways that would be illegal if they were doing it on a small scale. But it's an interesting thing. The bigger the fraudulent scheme is, the less illegal it is. And so that's why if, if someone's duping you on a telephone or phishing email scam, it, there's jail time. Like that's actual jail time, it just is. But if you have someone just blatantly misleading the public about far more dangerous things that causes far more destruction to the environment, to democracy, and to other parts of our society. Um, it, it, it's a difficult question because then, on the other hand, where do we draw the line? And that's where the First Amendment defense comes in and says, what kind of society do we have? Are we going to police what people say? Well, on a small scale, we do police what people say. Um, on a large scale, where do we draw the line? Uh, people who advocate the other side would say, well, are we going to have a ministry of information uh, or the Orwellian ministry of truth? And the answer is, what are courts? Are courts a ministry of truth? They have to determine the truth and falsity in every case before them, including fraud cases, including huge fraud cases. And there was actually of a finding in the uh, in in the a, a defamation case last summer. The, the name of the case escapes me, but but they find truth and falsity as a matter of law in large cases all the time. And so I don't know how much this Ministry of Truth defense is really a defense. Um, <laughs> I think we can draw the line. I think what happens is in this moment where, that we're living in, we're behind the curve. Those that profit off of misleading people have found a giant platform for doing so. It's still relatively legal. We're gonna need to move, move the legal line somewhat, but like jail time, I don't know. I don't know exactly when we arrive at that. Um, I don't know if there's some other. We love that people all the time for lying under the securities laws. Um, we lock up people all the time for intentional pollution. Um, the problem is that much of the activity uh, that was engaged in leaving aside the fraudulent statements, which I, I very much agree will develop over time. Um, uh, but, you know, a lot of that activity was permitted. Uh, so it's hard to, to show the requisite mens rea at that point to lock a guy up. Uh, California actually had, um, I, I, was do, I do a bunch of work in California. They have a law that the person who signs off of 
uh, of the forms about what activities, you know, compliance with uh, permits and all that, that if they lie or misrepresent, they go to jail. That's a state law. Um, so there's some opportunity there. But I don't think we're quite ready as a country to start locking up uh, the head of Exxon because of climate change actions in the past. So the answer is no, because in Delaware law, uh, well, the way I heard question, the question is about officers and directors. Is that right? Probably more about that. Uh, no, they're protected because, see, corporations are people too, right? But they don't go to jail. But neither do directors or officers because they're doing the corporate business. So if there are what one might perceive to be criminal action or whatever, it's on behalf of the corporation, which does, did I mention doesn't go to jail? So officers and directors are protected in that way too. So, you know, part of it is the way we've made the laws. I'm going to say there's actually a, a bigger issue about why the answer is no. I mean, there's some simple things. I mean, tobacco executives didn't go to jail in part because while they said all kinds of untrue thing about cigarettes, uh, an element of fraud is reliance, and no one believed them. I mean, cigarettes were called coffin nails decades before the, the Surgeon General's report, decades before the Reader's Digest expose that was, according to many people, supposedly the, 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 big, uh, the big event that affected American understanding. Um, that company said what they said, but, but it did not really affect um, uh, people's decision to smoke very much. In fact, there's some research that suggests that the average American actually marginally overestimated the, the, the risks of smoking. So it's not enough that they're lying if people have to rely, rely upon it. Um, that has to be why they're doing it. And that's not why people use fossil fuels. Fossil fuels aren't used because primarily because people are deceived, certainly not consumers, and they're making those decisions. And um, we think about where emissions are coming from now. As I mentioned, the United States is 11% of emissions. China is 29%. India and EU are 7% each. Russia is 5 And the rest, all the countries that are now below 5%, aren't going to stay that low for long because we live in a world in which, so, by conservative estimates, between 700 and 900 million people do not have access to reliable energy. Uh, we live in a world in which over a billion people do not have clean sources of fuels to cook their food. We live in a country in which a quarter of American households are energy insecure in the sense that they do not have electricity that, is, that is, meets what our general standards are for reliability and the like. And energy produces all sorts of important, valuable, life-extending things. And so the, to make the case to send folks to jail, you have to say you were lying and the reason they used your product was not because it got you to school, because it provided power for the hospital where you had surgery or delivered your baby, provided lights in this room and so on, but because some executive gave some BS testimony before Congress or put out an ad on the op-ed page of the New York Times, as some oil companies used to do, that was about as filled with spin as a lot of op-eds that appear on newspaper pages. I mean, it's within our kind of thinking about this as a problem, that's just not something that really works and, and is containable, but more importantly, it's not going to reduce atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases. And yes, insofar as we can identify really bad people that did really bad things, we can feel good if we do bad things to them too. But in terms of what the world is going to look like for us, for our children, for our grandchildren, I would argue we've got to keep our eye on the ball. And, in, and if we want these types of prosecutions or litigation or whatever else, we have to be able to say, okay, how do these cases actually produce consequences that allow us to reduce concentrations of greenhouse gases. And I think in some, I think in some instances, with some of the cases, we can make that argument. And with some of the cases, it may be, you know, this community is, because of where it's located, because of its lack of wealth, whatever else, is going to be particularly harmed by climate change, and they deserve compensation. OK. Totally on board with that idea. Um, but and, and that's not solving the problem in terms of mitigation. It's solving the problem in terms of protecting or buffering a particular community. But I, I just think in all of this, we want to step back from kind of who can we blame and at least first focus on how do we solve the problem? Because when I look at my kids and think about climate change and the kids that they might have, 
I'm far more worried about the climate they live in than whether or not the particularly noxious executive um, gets his or her comeuppance uh, in, uh, you know, in, in the mortal realm. So um, to go back to uh, the human rights that we kind of started this off with and to kind of pick up on Mike's question, I think you may be I think this discussion may be underestimating a little bit the effect that Millie Defense would have if it were actually affirmed by the Dutch Supreme Court in the European courts started thinking, well, does it really make sense for us to only be regulating companies that are like headquartered in Europe that puts them on an uneven playing field with other companies? You know, the trend in Europe is through the, the French law and the German law and the new EU law to basically start imposing due diligence, human rights obligations on companies that basically have any kind of business in Europe. I'm not predicting this, I just think that's an interesting development to watch. If Europe, a trend in the past, I mean, to take ozone depletion, for example, one of the reasons the US was able to take the lead in ozone depletion internationally in the 80s is because the US had already started regulating companies like Dow in the 70s in ways that Dow basically kind of flipped and was like, well, if we're going to have to get regulated, we're in favor of international regulation, therefore go to it. I'm not, there's a lot of differences between those two situations. I'm not predicting anything. I just think there's the possibility here for the serious litigation against corporations, not necessarily to be in the US, but maybe somewhere else. But my question for you is a little bit more specific than that. It's that, so you're all kind of gloomy about the current outlook and Jonathan's gloomy that even if the cases started getting decided, they would really have much of an effect. My question is, okay, say you can pick one decision. You get to basically choose the outcome of that decision, and it gets affirmed on appeal or whatever, so you don't have to worry about that. Is there one case, is there one imaginary or existing case that if you thought this case got decided the right way, it could kind of unlock this a little bit, or is it just not like that? Are there too many obstacles here for one decision to kind of flip or reframe in the words that the first speaker used, reframe the kind of imagining of how this kind of litigation goes? Or is there a possibility, you know, again, just imaginarily, that one case, if the decision came out the right way, it could kind of point a direction towards more successful cases in the US against corporations? I'm just curious. I mean, Wes has already kind of suggested fraud might be that kind of doctrine, maybe. I'm just kind of curious what you think about that. So let me uh, start with just the, um, John, the, your first point about the Royal Dutch Shell case. Mike, I, I misunderstood. I thought you were talking about agenda. So my, my, I apologize. Um, so because different cases, uh, different you know, litigants and all that kind of stuff, different outcomes. I think that the Royal Dutch Shell case is, you know, it is the biggest case out there when it comes to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. It has been upheld on appeal, and we'll see what happens. Um, that said, sorry. <laughs> um, Still, uh, and how I also heard your question is about how does it affect being able to sue a corporation? I was thinking of the U.S. You know, notwithstanding what we heard from Craig this morning, I know Craig, you, you have a comment, is, is uh, we don't borrow. I mean, we just don't care in the U.S. what's going on overseas, what's going on in other countries. Now there is some, you know, occasionally a judge will mention what's going on, but it's not our tradition. In fact, some Supreme Court justices have been, there have been articles of impeachment drawn up for considering foreign law. Remember that, you know, Justice Kennedy. Um, so, I mean, you know, USA, USA, you know, go good for us. Anyway, so that's so we don't borrow. But on the one thing, John, I don't know. You know, it wouldn't be any of the cases that are currently percolating because we don't have the laws. I wish we had a climate change act or something, you know, to enforce. But we don't. But uh, it's the Juliana case, I suppose. You know, if if that continues to have purchase. That's a good place. But that would be the human rights case. Um, and they haven't been that successful in the United States, except for the recent held decision. I would sort of think that uh, if a state's attorney general could bring public trust action, not so much for money, but for reduction of emissions and um, restoration of the environment in ways that would mitigate existing gases that are out there. Sort of the atmospheric trust idea that's been talked about. I think that might have a real impact. I mean, 
the Idaho attorney general probably wouldn't file suit, but New York, California would. All right, we have to close this last uh, panel so that we can have our closing argument today. Um, let me thank Cassandra for putting together this panel, um, the amazing panel. It's, it was a really good one to end on. Thank you all.